east of us. <laughs> and um, good morning still if anybody's from Alaska or Hawaii, I don't know. So um, you're still in the morning. So welcome to beginning to open up ideas for colleges early in their OER journey. And Una, you can start recording now. Thank you. Um, so just so you know, this is a panel of uh, people from all over the United States, and we're all on a different part of our journey. And we realize that some people new to OER may not feel like they have the resources or may not know how to start things. And sometimes when you're listening to SUNY or California or Open Oregon, you may feel a little overwhelmed. And so we're here to share with you um, our little parts of our journey. And hopefully when you leave here, you'll either have a new idea for your campus or you also connect with one of us or somebody else here that you can then collaborate with on your journey. Um, so I just wanna let you know that we have all sorts of people here because you're gonna realize a lot of us wear different hats. So we have a librarian, we have a faculty member, we have an instructional designer, a dean, an OER coordinator, and a director of teaching and learning. So there's lots of different people here. But before we start, I just wanna thank um, Una and Liz from CCC OER, that they are our background people that are helping to support us and kind of make this all happen. And hopefully if you're not involved with CCC OER, that um, you may wanna look it up and check it out and that's at cccoer.org and we'll give you that information also at the end of this presentation. Um, so right now we're first going to introduce ourselves. There we go. <laughs> and so um, here's the panel and so we're just going to say where we're from and a little bit about our institution and maybe how long that we've been in OER and that's where we'll start. So Susan, do you want to start? I'm Susan Bradley. I'm Dean of Humanities, Social and Behavioral Sciences at Butler Community College. We're a 97-year-old institution of about 5,500 FTE located in the rural Great Plains region just east of Wichita, Kansas. I've been at Butler for 25 years and in OER about two and a half, not long. And Kelly? Sure, I'm Kelly Carpenter. I'm from Lakeshore Technical College. I am the library manager there. Um, we are a small rural technical college that's right along Lake Michigan. We're about an hour from Milwaukee and an hour from Green Bay. And we serve about 10,000 students, but that actually only equals to about 1,700 FTE because a lot of ours are workforce training, apprenticeships, um, ABE, adult basic education. So we have a, a very small pocket that are actually degree seeking, which is what our OER is focused on. But we are one of the 16 technical colleges in Wisconsin, but we do not have statewide OER direction. Um, I've been at LTC for about 10 years, and we've been doing OER for about two. Great, thank you. Todd. Hi, my name is Todd Ellis. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning at Grayson College. We are a small college north of Dallas, Texas, uh, about 4,500 FTE. <clears throat> Our demographic is uh, about half rural, half suburban, and uh, over 51% of our students qualify for lower income. Grayson College has been involved in OER kind of a, from a bottom up perspective for about four years. And I've been in my position here for two years and I've been involved in OER for two years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lori Beth. Hey, I'm Lori Beth Larson. I'm here in Central Lakes College in Central Minnesota. We have about 5,000 students, a pretty small college. Um, we've been doing OER since uh, about two, uh, 2014. I've, um, I am the uh, lead faculty and we have a steering committee with a librarian and a dean and other faculty. So we're pretty, uh, um, we work from the ground up as well. We have a Z degree and about 38 faculty, uh, which is about a third of our faculty have participated in OER. 
to date. Awesome. And um, I'm leading the panel, and my name is Paula McNevage, and I'm from the College of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas. So I'm the urban one. <laughs> we have about 35,000 students, 30% uh, white, about 33% Hispanic, 10% African American, 10% Asian. So we kind of are the melting pot of everybody here. Um, I've been here almost three years and we've been kind of officially doing OER for about a year and it was also organic from the ground up. So we have a task force that has librarians, faculty, and people from e-learning um, that are on the task force that are helping out with this. So as everybody sees, we have a wide variety of different institutions and people in different capacities. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with the uh, Paula. Paula, oh, yeah. One second. Um, sure. I think you're missing Christina. Oh, is she here? Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Definitely. I didn't see you on. I didn't see you on my little thing either. So I, I apologize. Oh, <laughs> No problem. Um, I'm Christina Trundle. I'm the Montana Statewide OER Coordinator. Uh, and I've been working with OER for um, over 10 years in some capacity, whether teaching with it or starting campus initiatives. Uh, the Montana OER program is in its first year, so not even a whole year in this um, program. And the campuses that I serve range from uh, the larger schools with about 17,000 FTE to tiny tribal colleges with about 40 FTE. So um, I'm helping all of those campuses get their individual OER initiatives set up and they all have very unique ranges of um, student needs and resources and uh, questions. So. so yeah, now she's kind of the state <laughs> representative and I'm sorry. <laughs> So that's another whole aspect to think about too, is as opposed to just individual college also on a state perspective. So thank you for joining us, Christina, and welcome. <laughs> so now um, we're gonna talk a, bit, a little bit more about some different questions. So we've already kind of done one about how many years we're doing and what we're doing. So um, if anybody would like to share an accomplishment from the past year, to help people out that are just starting out, what are some things that have happened that in a year that you could possibly do? And I'm gonna open up to anybody, so. I don't mind going. Okay, thank you, Todd. Uh, we, had, we had several things that were accomplishments from our perspective of being fairly new and being small. Uh, but I think probably the most important was our OER micro grants. And we only had three the first year, but it, it, it moved our, our movement from a sort of an organic bottom up, people doing it out of goodness of their hearts to officially recognizing people doing this work and willing to pay them for it. So that was a big step for us. Thank you. And I, I wanna say that for new people that definitely, if you have the opportunity to either get a grant or to figure out how to get some money, but that's a great idea. So, um, so I just want to reiterate for new people that down the line, you may want to be thinking about that. I can go next. So okay. I think um, for us, we had a top down approach from the beginning. I actually had a president who came from the Louisiana Community and Technical College System. So he came with a really good understanding of our textbook affordability issues. Um, and he basically got a, a group of us together in a room and said he was gonna fully fund any early adapting faculty um, as long as they converted their, their textbook, which was a publisher paid textbook into a course that had no cost to students. So they could kind of point blank do whatever they wanted and now the people in the room, we were supposed to build it. So I think what helped us is we got on, you know, some kind of faculty senate or faculty development day. Um, and we were able to present a three hour uh, textbook affordability session to all full time faculty and they were required to attend. And at that meeting, we showed them an entire list from our bookstore of each required book. Um, and how much it cost. And then we did a breakdown of cost 
for course materials by program. And let me tell you, that was super eye-opening for some of our faculty because, um, you know, at a technical college, they have a hard enough finding course content that covers their, their curriculum and at a reading level that they needed that they sometimes forgot to look at cost. And they were finding that some of their, their textbooks cost more than it um, was for the course for the, um, yeah for the student to pay for the course at a technical college level. So that was really eye-opening and very scary to present, but that helped so many people, um, if not change to an OER book, change to a cheaper book. So that was something that we did that was super helpful if you're starting out, if you can get in front of a big group of faculty. Thank you. And um, can you remind us, was it like at a convocation day or some special day? Yes. Or, yep. yeah. It was required um, all faculty, we call it all faculty development day. Okay. Same thing. Yep. Yep. Awesome. So that's another great idea for people that are new to this um, to take advantage of those days when all faculty are together to see if you can do a workshop or a presentation at that. Thank you. What happened at our institution is that an ambitious young faculty member, wonderful uh, young woman, came to me and said, I'd love to write an OER for College Composition 1 and 2. Uh, may I do that? And my answer was yes, but then of course we had to figure out how. And that led to um, our use of an online template uh, for policy and procedure composition. It's uh, originated with Tidewater Community College and BC Open and is available through Lumen Learning. But it essentially helped us formulate our faculty compensation scheme and um, our relation to our college mission and our purpose and some definitions and some technical formats and all sorts of considerations that we might not have thought through initially. They both help with the initial big project and they help us or are helping us replicate uh, OERs in other disciplines now. And thank you, Susan, for sharing that. Um, the great thing about OER is if they put Creative Commons on it, like we can share and, and reuse. And as Susan said, she found some things from other institutions. So don't be afraid if you're new to this to look around for what other people have already done and have open for you to use. So thank you for sharing that. Um, anything from Christina or Lori Beth? Yeah, I can, I can uh, uh, say a few things. Uh, we have, um, like I, I think I already said, we have about 38 faculty who have um, participated in creating OER. We're, we're also um, working to get some of our OER published, and that's what we're doing this year. Um, and we have um, an open DORA, which is the Minnesota State Communi Community and Technical Colleges repository that is open. So we're trying to get a few more of our, our uh, we are published on that. We also um, are following, um, we're also looking into student OER specialists. And uh, David Dwork from Paradise Valley um, has shared his information. And Paula went to the, their uh, recent um, presentation now in Arizona. And so we're, um, we're working to get a Minnesota State grant. I saw a question in the chat window um, and we've been, most of our efforts have been funded over the last five and a half years from state uh, grants. We have an innovations grant that we've applied for a bunch of those. So that's kind of where we're getting some of our money and we're getting a little money from the college now as they see how important it is and useful. Great. So again, um, you're trying to tap into a statewide thing, so you should check to see if other um, places in your state are doing things. Um, I know here we're trying to, our library is also trying to kind of create something for all our faculty here. So that's another place you may want to tap in for new people on help for this thing are your librarians. So. 
So one accomplishment that we had in Montana that um, I was pretty excited about, um, I did have some grant funding to give out it within the first year, um, but more than grant opportunities, we offered a lot of professional development offer opportunities. And um, one of my grantees uh, talked her entire department into taking some professional development training uh, through the program. And they decided to remake after the summer, our first three months in this program, they decided to do uh, their entire degree as a ZTC degree. And so they're doing that department wide. Huge, huge win for the first few months of the program. Um, we also have a lot of, um, are encouraging a lot of collaborative work with faculty outside of their institution. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is uh, faculty who are developing OER content with um, their high school colleagues who are teaching dual credit. Uh, and I can't obviously fund those um, because they work for the high schools. Uh, but it was really uh, an impressive move to get all the high school dual credit courses onto the same uh, curriculum and using OER. So those are some really good natural partners as your local high schools as well. And I would say for um, CSN that um, I would say we moved the needle just a little bit and to me to have one more or two more faculty um, adopt an open textbook you know, is an accomplishment. And I think our first year was very much awareness. So we were doing a lot of, um, during our convocations or during the open ed week to try to just do where, what's OER, we are, what's an open textbook, you know, what is this all about? So that's really what we did our first two semesters. And now we're kind of moving forward to try to help um, departments identify what are some of these textbooks. So we're trying to do the adopt um, so there's three things you can adopt. You can adapt where you can take something and maybe switch it up with other things or you can create. And we're really trying to not go to create to maybe start with adopt um, that you already have a textbook. And why don't you choose that one over a paid publisher textbook. So, so Una, are there some questions? Yes, you did have some questions. I think okay. we answered uh, Rumiana's question about grants. Um, we, and she can re-ask that if she needs more information. But Jane Ishibashi also asked about where, um, so how are faculty getting training and support on accessibility uh, for the disabled and attribution questions? And then she asked, where did the funding for the professional development come? Was it from equity funding, administration support, et cetera? So I, I'll just talk about accessibility. I would encourage you to um, team up if you have a disability resource center or some group already on campus that you can, or if you have an e-learning um, instructional technologist, instructional designers or something, that they can help along with accessibility. Because that's my another hat I have as an instructional designer, OER, accessibility. <laughs> and so um, that's what I was going to say to those people about accessibility is that you may want to partner with some other people already on campus that know that. I even pulled our accessibility accommodations manager into our task force so that they could hear all the OER stuff. So that we made sure we had that person at the table. They brought a lot of insights that we maybe didn't always think about. So that was helpful. Yeah. Our, our instructional designer is also on our steering committee. So we have a librarian and a dean and a bunch of faculty and our instructional designer is on there. And she's, she's catching up and learning a lot about um, uh, universal design principles. We have created an OER development process that's part of a faculty development workshop or two in the area. And accessibility is part of that workshop in that process. As for funding, there were uh, no funds available when we started. I was able to convince our academic vice president 
to loan initial OER development money out of her program development fund, which we eventually paid back out of a modest charge of fee that we are passing on to students. So in short time, the project paid for itself. So to, to build on what Susan said for funding, um, your administration is a good place to start. Um, but areas on campus that I've seen do really good funding help with this kind of work is also your foundation office. We tend to think of that as student scholarships, but they're really happy to promote projects that help students. Um, and then going to your student government or student activities organizations, they have their own um, uh, pools of money and they have done some really great work uh, in funding and Lane Community College and Oregon is um, one that stands out in my mind, but that fund faculty incentives um, or bring in speakers for faculty professional development around OER. Your State Board of Ed is also a really great area to go to. Um, if you're just a low, <laughs> one school, you could actually be the catalyst to get some state funding going. Um, in Montana, I know it was one school approaching the state and that became a statewide initiative. So don't, don't rule out the higher ups outside of your school as well. In Kansas, we're having a state OER showcase on March 26th. Institutions are presenting posters about their programs today and their development process to staff members of our Board of Regents and to many state legislators in an effort to get a state funding mechanism started. Yeah, and that sounds super, Susan. I, I wanted to add just one thing, Paula, because one thing I've seen is sometimes there are other initiatives, other grant programs out there that are not specifically, they don't say OER on them. And I think of ones around equity and, um, uh, sorry, what is it? Um, culturally sensitive materials. You will see those will come out from different organizations, sometimes even from uh, the Department of Ed. Um, and, um, or it could be about improving learning. Um, I see a lot of those in the STEM, where OER is a natural because of the fact that you can modify things, customize, you can integrate all of these different pedagogical devices into it. So don't neglect to look at those grants too as potential opportunities to bring OER in. And that's actually, we are using a STEM grant from the state. That's kind of how we're, we're easing into it. So like you said, it wasn't necessarily OER, but it was a STEM grant from the state. The <clears throat> institution that I came from in Oregon, um, we were using Title III grant funds for OER. Um, those funds were directly um, written into equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we were able to use OER as a way to meet that goal. And I, I wanted to tag on uh, that what I've used is cccoer.org has research, and definitely look at the research because you should back up your asking for money with research. Um, Cause right now I'm in the process of trying to ask administration for money going, oh, it's shown that if you um, give faculty um, some money for their work, they're more likely to try something. And so I would like to try this and there's research based on that. And also pedagogical research um, success rates, all of that. So I just want to let people know that there's a lot of research out there and you can find a lot of that at the cccoer.org and that can help you with, with asking for money. <laughs> Did we hit all the questions now, Una? Yeah, yes, Paula, I think, I think we did for now. Thank you. Okay, awesome. No, thank you for checking this out. So um, now we're gonna share the opposite. Like, <laughs> what's one thing we wish we could do over? Cause we'd like to share with you some things so that you may not have to 
do it. So anybody want to start that one? <laughs> I'll start that one. Okay. Um, I keep rethinking this one and how I conceptualize it. Uh, I guess it's in the context for me of our initial outreach, my initial outreach was to faculty, uh, especially given that there had been, like I said, a kind of more organic movement a couple of years before I'd been here. There was sort of a trajectory of outreach to faculty, so I kind of continued with that. But what I should have done, which is what I'm doing now, is make sure there's an outreach to students and that students know and make that con connection that OER, for a lower income student, yeah, we know the OER means the five R's, but to a lower income new student, OER means free. And I need to make sure I'm reaching out to students, even the new ones that come in as they come in every eight weeks here, OER means free. How do they know that? How do they ask that? Because I feel like we're at a plateau where all the teachers who would or could do OER have and the other ones aren't really moving forward. There's kind of a, uh, a canned content question uh, or where a lot of faculty really like Cengage and things like that and kind of seem to be the teacher for you. And so I feel like there's a little bit of a stalemate and I sh I'm reaching out more to students now. Thank you. I, I totally agree because that's one of my things was try to almost align on student and faculty together on this movement of what, what this is all about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can second that. So that is one thing that we've learned after communicating with the faculty first and having that big group of early adopters, um, but then going to your SGA. When we went last year, I don't think there was a single student in the room who knew what OER or even knew what their faculty were doing to reduce the cost. So once we kind of explained, you know, here's what this means, here's what this means when you see it in your course, um, they were much more interested in it. And then even coming back, I came back this year a few weeks ago and kind of did a follow up for new students and to see, you know, did, did interest and knowledge increase. And they were like experts, like they knew it. Um, our SGA is actually taking their, um, going to the legislatures with an OER clause that they want to get funding for faculty at a state level. So, I mean, they have power. I think that was one thing that we did not um, capitalize on as much as we could have. And now I see it happening statewide. So that is definitely, I'll piggyback on Todd, um, work with the students in SGA and get them as educated as possible because their voice really matters, um, especially at a community and technical college level. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that if we did anything, we made our task too difficult or too hard at the outset because that's who we are, educators. We love those challenges. But if uh, an institution or a team or a committee can cut out the acronyms, the educationese, uh, the technical terms as much as possible and speak in terms of the digital revolution and the restructuring of the publishing industry and the potential to give students much more access to quality educational materials at a lower price than before. Those are all really strong selling points that we make a big I think the thing that surprised me that I wish I would have done earlier is ask um, in the CCC OER community or just people connections, making connections, um, somebody has a good idea. It's a sharing community, which is, which, uh, I don't know, I think, I think there's been maybe a, a trend over the last, or at least when I started 20 years ago, to hold on to everything you have very tightly. And uh, so I think I wish I would have asked more questions. Um, I had some good ideas, but I, I uh, wasn't sure uh, where to go or what to do, but getting on a CCC OER website, the listserv is amazing. And uh, like case in point, David Dwork, um, he uh, was willing to zoom in a meeting with me and give me everything he had. And then Paula went to the 
the um the presentation and she sent me stuff so yeah asking questions people like to share in this community so one thing that um I, I tell every campus that I work with is to, uh, yes, you need to educate and get the word out there, but do what you can to get all of the stakeholders at the table. And so students, your bookstore, your faculty, your admin, your instructional design or accessibility people, um, because you're, any, any initiative you do, if you can get even half of those people together, um, will grow and you'll have more people understanding what's happening. Um, a lot of times we tend to do very siloed work in higher ed and we don't know the great things that everyone's doing. So um, really approach it uh, as, a, as an entire institution, not just reaching out to your faculty. Um, another thing, and uh, Todd mentioned this um, earlier this week, is to champion and really um, praise the people who are already doing OER work, the faculty member who's been silently doing it on their own when you find out, um, make them champions and, and let, let the whole campus community know what great work they've done. Uh, that's really important. Uh, and celebrate all of your little milestones. And um, the other thing, and, and I'm going to piggyback off what Lori Beth said, it is a great open community and you will find that you have faculty and um, administrators and students ready to engage at a variety of levels. This might be very new and it might be something they've known about for a while and they want to jump in at a deeper level. So we don't always have the infrastructure to provide when we're starting a new initiative. So use the community. It is a very giving community. If I have a faculty who wants to, you know, develop a tool for some course that is way beyond my knowledge or skill level um that's not that's not insurmountable um it's a matter of reaching out to other institutions that do oer work and connecting those faculty they will build off of each other so you don't have to provide everything but be willing to engage at layers of where people are interested and where their knowledge base is those would be my top bits of advice to getting started and things that I learned the hard way <laughs> um, my first go round. so um the thing that I'm gonna share I don't know if I would do it over but I just want to prepare you that it may happen and I think things evolve is what your definition is at your community college at your college at your institution so we started out saying OER and then we realized, well, there's a lot of people that are doing a no cost because there's a lot of people that are actually using um, stuff from the library or the library will actually have an ebook that 35 people can use. And so that's a no cost for students, which is something that we're kind of looking at. So it's not truly OER, but it's helping a student because we know here, especially in the urban area, that money is a big problem of buying the books. And then there's also the low cost. So when I went to the um, open ed, the national level, I kind of sat there. And so I'm going to share this with you that um, I'm okay with the low cost because if I can get a faculty member to move over to um, a different system that may only cost $20 or $25 per student than $125, that that's okay. But there are some people um, that may want to just be purists and say it's only OER. So I just want to share with you that you're going to kind of figure this out on your own campus. So we as a group decided the no cost, low cost is some of our definition, the no cost including OER or including um, stuff from the library and that it's okay to move the faculty member who's really scared to go away from Pearson publishing stuff to move it over to Newton or Lumen Learning or other platforms that are using open textbooks along with our platforms. So I just wanted to share that with you. It's not something I would do over, but you're going to 
it's almost like an evolution going, oh, we may want to rename this. So just to warn you, it may, you may rename it in the middle of a year later. So that's all that I was going to share with you. Um, Una, any new questions? Yeah, we had a question from Rumiana. Um, another question and a very good one. Um, so she asked, what kind of communication systems do you have in place to share who is using what OER? And I believe she meant on, your, on her campus. Um, I'm a single librarian. I know some faculty who use OER, but I would like to have a way to know which OER are used in which courses and to get faculty to share information instead of the silo approach. Um, and I, I sent her a link to uh, a statewide site that I think many of you are aware of, which is the openoregon.org site, where um, all Oregon uh, faculty who participate in that um, have, who participate in OER, have shared their information about what resources they're using. Um, and um, I, uh, Christina may actually have more information about that because I know she used to work within that system. And in, in, in that, um, the Open Oregon Resources is a fabulous uh, um, list. I don't think that it's totally inclusive of everyone who's doing OER because it's voluntary to um, submit. But all that started out with uh, in the very early days was a Google form. And so in Montana, I've started a very similar thing. Um, there's a Google form and I ask each you know, the administrators send it out, or the library director sends it out, or faculty department chairs send it out um, asking faculty to sign up so that you have a better list. Um, and in that way, I was able to get more information about faculty who were already using OER that I hadn't worked with, um, or, you know, their campus librarian hadn't worked with. So, yeah, just saying that, and, and even um, I know there was a college in Oregon who we're giving out little like $5 Starbucks gift cards to faculty who would report their OER usage because and the students did that they wanted to know like how do we thank you we want to know who's doing it so um, if you're doing it in a light of not one more step that we are forcing you to do but hey we want to celebrate what you're doing and share out your good work um, how you approach it is really important and that's very much how Amy's approached creating her list is how can we praise the work you're doing? Um, I'll say too for us, we, I worked with tons of people in instruction and I actually got our two definitions. Um, like Paula said, we completely revamped. We have an OER definition and we created a zero textbook cost definition. And we got those two put on our course development form. So all new faculty, and again, this took two years to get done. Um, so every time a faculty member changes their curriculum, they can check if they're doing ZTC or if they're doing OER. And that sends me an email letting me know which class they're changing. And then I add it to a, a homegrown Excel sheet. But at least I can keep track and I can quick run out to our bookstore website and see what book they're currently using so I can get the cost before they change it in the bookstore and say no textbook required. So that took a lot of time and communication. So I mean, if you could make that happen, it's been really slick. Uh, we're only like a month in to me getting the emails, but I've already gotten like five emails. So I'm very excited. I can share what um, we're in the middle of doing. <laughs> So I actually have a bookstore that's very open, like, hey, Paula, I'll share with you, like, who doesn't have books, like, uh, for anything. And then I can look in Canvas to kind of see, oh, they're using an open textbook or they're using uh, library stuff. It is a little bit time consuming, but what we're planning on doing is they're going to be giving us the list before um, courses are opened. And so we're hoping to create a list with a little uh, waiver going faculty may change their section, but what we're doing is um, we're just creating a list and putting it on our OER website so students could go there. And we're going to advertise through the Student Senate and um, other means that I'm starting with. So that's kind of where we're starting. And I'm not sure if that was the question is that's how we're 
trying to share with students what are the ones. We're not allowed to put it in our system because it's a statewide system and we have to like get okay through a lot of other people. So we're starting with like a PDF on our website of a list of things. So that's how I was gonna answer that question on listing what is open for students or no cost or low cost. <laughs> so. We had we had a PDF on our website for a while as well, which was very time consuming and very frustrating to develop. Um, but we're part of a Minnesota state um, is now piloting a program to have OER searchable in courses. So I think that'll incentivize um, incentivize a faculty to make sure that their course actually has a, a no cost or a zero cost and there's a variety of um, things you can choose so that when students are searching they can search for that we're part of a pilot um, stay tuned i'm not exactly sure how it'll go but that's what that's what we're at, at, at trying right now Are we, are we doing future plans? Not yet, but right. if you wanted to start, we can. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was hearing future plans. No, we were just talking about um, the question. Well, I guess the question was taken many different ways, mm -hmm. but it was kind of like telling people how, marking how things are, that they're open, oh. certain courses are open. Right. But do you want to start? So what are your future plans, Todd? Three future plans. Uh, <laughs> To make them short, uh, our math, none of our math department uses OER, whereas, for example, all of our history and government does. And uh, it seems like a low hanging fruit to me. So I created a algebra course, copied the whole course from Canvas Commons, put in an OpenStax textbook, matched module chapter for chapter, module for module. So I'm basically uh, showing some math teachers how they could use OER, trying, trying to open that up a little bit, trying to get the math department to, to, to suggest it, get them interested without making it seem like, you know, we, you, we need you to do this or you have to do this, but just growing interest in the math department. Uh, two, increasing student awareness, like I said before, just reaching out, meeting with the SGA, and also because I get new students all the time, uh, Canvas announcements that go out to all students every semester saying, here's what OERs are, here's the five R's. One of them means free, just not only getting students aware of what they are, but we're thinking up how do we get students to request OERs? And me and a few others are working on that right now. One is getting student awareness of what they are, and two is telling students what to do about that awareness for helping the college move forward in places where maybe we're a little bit stagnated on things that we could move forward on. And then lastly, we're identifying an OER degree pathway in our general studies. Uh, we think really about five courses, if we could get it, we could have a general studies pathway. So that's, that's the plan for now. Awesome. Anybody else want to share a future? I can go. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I, you know, it's funny, we're all kind of at these different levels and we all tackle things differently, but I would love um, to work on policy. So we have this whole initiative, but we don't, we don't have any policies set. So I, that's my, I kind of my next thing is we need to get some things in writing um, that our college is going to agree on and that this is, this isn't going away. So I think that's always a fear of we start all these initiatives and projects and then, you know, it kind of fizzles out and then it dies. And I don't want that to happen. So that's a goal for me to help get policy in place um, and kind of future proof it. You know, where is the money going to come from? Um, so I think those are all some big things that we're looking at. Um, the state of Wisconsin put out a scale of adoption assessment, which is really helpful. I actually got a group of people together last week to go through that and it, it really uh, helped us pinpoint some other things that we need to work on. And one of them is um, 
we need to figure out how to label it in our student system before students register for the class. So that's one thing that Wisconsin does not have. Um, and, and I am gonna kind of look at some states that have got this. I don't think anyone has it figured out, but I think um, that's, students have to know before they sign up that they are getting, you know, the course, the course material is free. So somehow figuring out how to label, I think everyone's kind of working through what, how does that look and how do we get students more aware um, before they sign up for the course. So those are some things that we're trying to tackle this coming year. So Christina, did you want to share? Oh, I, I, yeah, I was going to talk about um, the professional development opportunities for faculty. So um, one thing that I learned was that faculty who are interested in adopting and will just blindly adopt a textbook, a good percentage of them uh, go back to their publisher text after a few years. And that is because they don't have the instructional design or um, really the knowledge to develop and build their textbook for their students, which is the potential. So um, I launched an uh, instructional design online course for faculty this year, and we had such good success with it that we're gonna offer that every semester, so three times a year, um, and open it up to the public. And that is really a big goal to have everyone who's using OER to go through that or a similar type of course they have that basics so they um, are not floundering after a while or deciding they hate it and they're going to go back to a different resource. Um, and the other thing that is a goal for um, Montana for the next year is really building up those cross institutional partnerships. Um, so uh, one of those is kind of um, reaching out to the smaller, getting technical and community colleges connected with faculty at the larger universities that might have more resources, uh, as well as tribal colleges. Um, we have seven tribal colleges in our state who have the biggest need and the least amount of resources. So how do we connect what other faculty are doing with, um, and how can faculty support each other uh, with projects on campuses that don't have as many resources. So those cross institutional connections are a big goal for the next year. Susan, do you have anything that you guys are thinking about? Um, yes, well, I don't know if I've already mentioned that the state of Kansas is having a state OER conference next September, mm. Fort Hayes State University. And we'll be bringing in a keynote speaker from the outside, as well as training faculty and administrators from higher ed across the state. And our hope is that this conference will continue and become uh, key to the spread of the movement across the state. Awesome. And for me, I think our goals is we want to go to present at departments and share some open textbooks with departments and start with saying, when you're choosing your new textbook, you also include an open textbook as something that you're looking at. Um, because we're kind of the organic, you know, faculty to faculty, we're thinking that may be a way to get more faculty to look at OER and to think about it. Um, what we'd like to do is we would like to do more of our gen ed to be all OER as opposed to a Z degree because that can touch like every student that comes here. Uh, and so that's what we're aiming for. And then I think my other thing for the next year is what a lot of us are trying to do is trying to get more students involved and chatting with them and seeing how they can get involved. So Una, are there any more questions? Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> yes, You're doing a great job helping out with links and all that, so thank you. <laughs> oh, and other folks too as well. So thanks to everyone who's participating. Um, so we had another question around the bookstore and um, how do you regulate relationships with the bookstore and um, 
uh, Rumiana is concerned that um, it might affect the bookstore margins and is that, you know, how can she be prepared for that? Well, I'm just going to share. So I don't, we're with Follett's and the bookstore came to my first task force and said, how can we help you? So I'm like, well, <laughs> so I, I guess my relationship with them is we're looking at it that faculty have choice. And so if they're choosing OER or not, um, that's part of, of our bookstore. So I, that's all I'm going to say. I haven't heard anything about margins and all that. So. And it, I know we, we also have followed and that did come up. Um, we don't have as good a relationship with our bookstore rep then. Um, we have had a, a pretty rocky relationship when OER, um, where that goes. So I think we try to tread lightly, um, but we did have that conversation that yes, bookstore margin is going to go down. As a college, are we okay with that? Like we had to take that to the president because so for some colleges that is a big revenue maker and we had, we had to acknowledge it and they were okay with it. They will find revenue other places. So that is a conversation I think you do have to have if you depend on that margin. Um, and I, I didn't even, I didn't know how big of a margin that is for some colleges. So um, it definitely has gone down as we have had more adoptions and your college has to acknowledge and, and be okay with it and kind of strategize what will they do different without that money or what were they doing with the money? If it, for us, it was going to foundation. So that's where we talked with foundation and said, is there a different pool of money that we could use for student scholarships um, so that they don't notice anything different? But the college is picking that up instead of the revenue from the bookstore. And, and that's why um, I think it's really important to have bookstore managers or leadership at the table when you start these conversations and you say, hey, we're working on this so that they prep. I've had um, bookstore managers who were so excited to have less textbooks because they had more space to sell the swag and things that they make more money on than they do textbooks. I've had others who were really opposed. Um, so having them at the table and making sure that they know that they're a part of the conversation is important. Um, but Una mentioned earlier that it's important to go in with research. And I would suggest that NACS, the National Association of College Stores, which most campus bookstores are a part of, is a great resource. Um, they just published a paper on um, publishing trends and it included a bunch of information for OER, but the national organization is really in support of OER and uh, has identified some areas that bookstores can make changes in different things they can do to help um, keep bookstores in the OER conversation, whether that's print on demand, um, or things like that. So there's a lot of great uh, research statistics and tools on the NAACS site. One thing that's come up in our discussions at Butler has been the idea that perhaps somewhere down the road, we need to have not a bookstore manager, we have an independent store, a wonderful a long time manager, but uh, move from that position to something like an instructional materials and supplies manager, or a position in which an able person could uh, help faculty and students uh, create and select and use materials along an entire spectrum of possibility. In other words, it would be a more comprehensive position. Yeah, we have a steering OER steering committee and the bookstore manager was on our steering committee as well. And that, that uh, it made a few conversations a little easier, but again, it's not a, it's not a very comfortable position. But I think, like, go oh, ahead. go ahead. I'll second what Susan just said, you know, we're considering that same type of evolution 
of like instructional resources. And I see on there, Cindy um, from Nicolay kind of has that similar role that's more comprehensive. And I feel like that is something that more colleges may want to look at. What, what would that look like at your institution? I just wanted to add one thing. This is Una again. Um, I put a link in the um, chat window from Campus Technology, but it was covering a report that was released about two weeks ago from Achieving the Dream uh, from their OER degree initiative, which was launched at 38 colleges in 13 states. And they had 11 research colleges that they did some very in-depth uh, uh, research with. And one of them was how did it impact the, um, the bookstore? Um, when these colleges developed these full degree pathways. And in fact, they found that the effect was very small. Um, bookstores are not making as much in general from the sales of books as they did in the past. Students are buying them elsewhere, sometimes not buying them. Um, and it was, it was under two digits. So it was in the single digit effect. So it was actually very small. So I would recommend you read that research. It was really quite interesting. I can't remember the exact percentage right now, but it was very interesting research on cost effects of OER at institutions. So it was very unique, the research they did. Um, it wasn't strictly limited to student savings and outcomes, but also looked at the institutional effects. And actually, you bring up a good point, you know, and the research is showing that about 40% of students don't even buy a textbook. So the bookstore is already losing money because the students can't even afford to buy the textbook. And so again, we're looking at it more from a student's success and access and equity that all students should have a book and not only certain students have the book. And um, so, so maybe that's why our bookstore is not too worried about it. I, I don't know, because maybe they're already seeing that. Um, and I also think though publishers for the last 15 years have been figuring or trying to figure out the new things with all the technology as we see the evolution. So who knows what the next evolution of publishing uh, higher ed tech will be. So. Any um, other questions? I did put on, um, this next slide that if you're wanting to contact any of us, here's our email. So if there's any particular person you wanna keep asking questions to or may wanna that our institution kind of like yours that you wanna talk more or we're at the same part of the journey that um, here is our contact information. And then um, the last slide was just uh, making sure that you know about um, TCC OER. And so Una and um, Liz are both part of that organization. So if you're wanting to know more about um, any of those, you have their contact information also. So last call for questions. <laughs> We're at about um, two minutes. I just want to thank Una and Liz for always being there <laughs> and providing so much information and support in the short time that we've been members. It's been great. Yeah, I'll second that uh, appreciation. Thank you. And that's why I'm putting the plug for any of you who may don't or may have are not involved with CCCOER that we're hoping that you may want to join and. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Very, very helpful, very useful, friendly. I'll third that. <laughs> okay, everybody join. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much to the panel for taking the time out. Uh, and I, we actually laughed because we did a practice and we learned so much from each other. So all of you participants, I'm hoping that you're walking away with no, one new thing to do one new connection and that you keep on um, the great awesome work that we're all doing uh, for our students. So that's what it's all about. So anything else you know? Oh. I said thank you Paula for moderating. Oh. <laughs> Bye.
nothing else from me. I'm going to put a link ab about the inclusive access from the student PERGS group in um, the chat window. But oh, awesome. I have to find and then it. I encourage people to look. There are lots of regional conferences. I know Florida's having one, New England's having one, Michigan's having one. I just went for, to Arizona. So definitely look for regional ones if you can't go to the national, and they're going to be great also. So that's my other pitch on staying connected. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. I think we can stop recording because I think we are done. Have a great afternoon.